So, so uh, when, when did the final one come out? The eighth. Yeah, I missed it. But, but uh, he made it back okay to Belgium from the Soviet Union, right? Yeah, great. Oh, oh, what about Snowy? <laughs> yeah. What? A tiger costume? Oh, look, that's awesome, but I, I gotta go. Hi. Hey. Headline of the month. France orders the evacuation of the Rhineland. Evacuation ordered. The last phase of difficulties. The French government gave all military command posts in the Rhineland the order to evacuate the third occupation zone. The Rhineland is to be cleared. All conditions of the Young Plan have been met. I'm Indy Nidell. I'm Spartacus Olson. This is The Rise of Hitler. Welcome back to the Weimar Wire, bringing you all of May's most momentous mayhem and madcap memories. But first, let's briefly recap April. Chancellor Brüning and his new government overcame multiple votes of no confidence, but managed to stay in the driver's seat. The DNVP, the Conservative National People's Party, were battered and bruised with a potential internal split on the horizon. The Reich Protection Law was used for the first time targeting both Nazis and Communists. The Communist Reich Youth Day brought chaos and violence to Leipzig. Now back to May. France leaving the Rhineland, huh? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's big news. And five years earlier than the Treaty of Versailles says that they have to. What do the French say about that? Good question. But let's hit the other big headlines from May 1st. International Workers' Day is upon us. Different players are ritualizing the day for different purposes while the workers express their struggles. Communists and Nazis resort to violence once more to sort out their political differences. In an unexpected move, the Social Democrats, the Communists, and the Nazis work together to bring down the government in Saxony. In Turingen, there is a face-off between the local Minister of the Interior and the Federal Minister of the Interior. Former French Prime Minister Aristide Briand shares his vision for Europe. Briand's memorandum about that future is not the only thing having an impact across the continent. The month begins with May Day, International Workers' Day. All around the globe, workers take to the streets to celebrate their professions, the working class, and to raise awareness for their struggles. In Germany, these struggles are as relevant as they've been all year. While the unemployment figures themselves remain somewhat constant, individual sectors of the economy continue to experience mass layoffs and shorter or unpaid shifts. Especially in heavy industry like mining or steel, the workers face setback after setback. A communique from a conglomeration of workers' unions in the mining sector sent to the Minister of Labor highlights these struggles. We will no longer tolerate the imposition of additional unpaid shifts and the mass dismissal of miners under any circumstances. We demand vigorous and legal measures from the right government that enable the miners to have a decent existence. For the Social Democrats, the 1st of May is a welcome distraction from the dire reality. While they do not ignore the economic pain suffered by many of their voters, they choose to have a more optimistic outlook. For them, it is a celebration of, of socialism, of democracy, and the future of the Social Democratic movement in Germany. A speech from SPD politician Peter Glassmann, a member of the Reichstag, illustrates the mood. When I overlook this square today, I am reminded of one of the greatest Germans, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who wrote in Faust, Such a crowd I'd like to see standing with free people on free ground. Whoever sees this picture of our Berlin demonstrations knows and feels that Despite all the bluster, social democracy has the future on its side. Thousands of Social Democrat Party members and their supporters assemble in all major cities throughout Germany. Their protests are peaceful and orderly, for the most part. Something that cannot be said for the other group that claims the 1st of May as its own. The communists believe that the Social Democrats have no business celebrating the 1st of May since they have betrayed the cause. Mockery of the socialism that they have desecrated, betrayed, and exchanged for the paid lay service of the bourgeoisie. The German proletariat does not march under the black, red, gold banners of class treason, nor in the ranks of social fascism. 
While this feeling of betrayal is mostly general, it is also connected to last year's events on the same day, the Blood May as it is now known. The Social Democrats were in power then, and the Berlin police chief was also a member of the SPD. In those demonstrations, the police were quite brutal in response to the protesters, which led to the communist protesters answering in kind. The police then used deadly force. Max Gemeinhardt, a member of the SPD and the Reichsbahnia, was shot because he did not comply quickly enough with an order to close his window. By the end of the day, the police had armored cars with machine guns in the streets to quell the unrest, and many civilians lay dead on the streets of Berlin. The communists know exactly who to blame for last year's disaster. Do they think they can so quickly make us forget the bloodshed of May 1929 so quickly? The victims of last year's Bloody May are still unavenged. And they proclaim their message. The Communist Party is the party of May Day. With its leadership and slogans, the masses of workers are leading the political mass struggle and revolutionary mass demonstration on this World Day of the Proletariat. Fortunately, last year's events do not repeat themselves and there are no bloodbaths in the cities of Germany. But the left is not the only political faction which uses the beginning of May to send some message of intent to its followers and rivals. The Nazis on the evening of May 2nd hold a huge rally in the Sportpalast in Berlin with their leader Adolf Hitler speaking in person. In the National Socialist Movement, the will of the people to renew themselves is embodied, so the immense sacrifices of recent decades were not in vain. German thought and racial consciousness must be realized. Neither proletarians nor bourgeois should become political institutions. German nationality must be defended with utmost fanaticism. Fighting for parliamentarianism is fighting for stupidity. In contrast, National Socialism unites Germany's elite, ensuring ultimate victory. As you can see, the parties have very different visions for Germany's future. For the communists and the Nazis, the chasm between their visions is, however, bridged in one area a readiness for violence. As we've seen, violence between the far left and far right is a weekly, sometimes daily occurrence, and this month proves to be no exception. On the night of May 16th, members of the communist sports club Germania 1910 stumble across a small group of SA members around 11 p.m. in the east of Berlin. The SA is the Nazis' paramilitary organization. A scuffle begins, and the Nazis let loose some wild gunshots. Two of the communists hit the ground, covered in blood. They do not get up again. The police investigation identifies one of the shooters, but also alleges that these Nazis have used dumb dumb bullets once again, an accusation that the Nazi party vehemently denies. Dumb dumb propaganda against National Socialists. Do not let yourselves be provoked. The report should be viewed with extreme caution. We have seen all sorts of things before. This seems to be clear propaganda. We warn the public against falling for such maneuvers and affirm that our party bans the carrying of weapons. So they say no bean shooters. No Chicago Lightning. No Chopper Squad. No Gats. Then, on May 29th, a mob of communists in Hamburg attacks a group of Nazis who are on their way to a party meeting. Surrounded by the far stronger and constantly growing group of communists, 20 of the Nazis suffer serious injuries, although none are fatal. The Nazis claim that communist rhetoric is responsible for these attacks. Your last hour has come, the Hamburger Volkszeitung has been touting for days. When this Moscow-backed liar then falsely claimed that the Nazis had stabbed a communist party member, the desired murderer's mood was set for the scum of the world port. These are only two of the many such clashes happening this month. Given this open and violent strife between communists and Nazis, and also that both hate the Social Democrats, who themselves harbor nothing but contempt for the former two, it is very surprising that this month, a joint initiative from all three leads to the dissolution of parliament in Saxony. The state government under Wilhelm Bunge was a coalition of parties headed by the German People's Party. See, although the Social Democrats were, and still are, easily the strongest party in Saxony, the more conservative parties managed to exclude them and the communists from the ruling coalition. But to maintain this, they had to work with the NSDAP, that's the Nazi party. At the beginning of May, this proves to be their downfall when the Nazis feel betrayed by their partners. 
We pushed for the formation of an anti-Marxist committee that would rid the Saxon administration of Marxist influences, but Mr. Bunga thought it best to bypass our conditions as much as possible, and as a true young patriot, he supported the Young Plan. Thus, the fate of his cabinet was sealed, and we supported the communist vote of no confidence. Communists, on the other hand, pushed for the dissolution of the state legislature because… If the bourgeoisie has its way, Saxon will become a second Thuringen, another strong hold of fascism in Germany. There is only one force that stands against the fascist wave, that can halt the National Socialist Murder Party, that can unite the proletarian masses into a decisive defensive front against National Socialism, the Communists. The Social Democrats justified their decision by saying that the government in Saxony was a parliament in which the bourgeois parties despite their weakness, firmly held the position that the large working masses must be excluded from government. The National Socialists played a sad role in the tragedy of the Saxon government. According to their own admission, the Nazis aimed to establish a National Socialist bloc in central Germany. It is interesting to note how each of the three supporters of the joint parliamentary dissolution proposal points to one or both of their co-conspirators as part of their reasoning. The Social Democrats blame the Nazis. The Nazis blame the Marxists and the Young Parties, aka the SPD. And the Communists continue the trend, blaming the Nazis. One final remark of the Social Democrats is also of interest concerning other events from this past month. What in Nazi Saxon means shows a Nazi Thuringen. As many of you are aware, Thuringen is the first state where the Nazis managed to become part of a governing coalition. Their interests there are represented by Wilhelm Frick. He has managed to anger Berlin in both of his capacities, Minister of the Interior and Minister of Education. Actually, it was more than that. He first managed to push through an enabling act at the end of March, giving him extraordinarily local legal powers of executive decree. The national government has two big issues with Frick. One is the appointment of local police chiefs. Basically, Frick wants to fill all open posts in Thuringen with Nazi party members. The Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung comments. Perhaps the new police directors are not, or not all, formerly registered members of the National Socialist Party. But there can be practically no doubt that Mr. Frick will have chosen only those men who are politically compliant with him. Berlin's problem with this is that Nazi police chiefs would violate the apolitical character of the Schutzpolizei, protection police, under the Constitution. If Frick doesn't comply, Berlin is both willing and able to cut federal funding to his state. Well, we'll see if it comes to that. In any case, the Nazis see this as an attack against them, calling the threat from Berlin the Rape of Thuringen, the battle against Berlin unitarism, and the usually dreaded coercive methods of the Berlin unified Marxists. In any case, this represents a challenge from the united reactionaries of the new Germany, worried about their November glory. Besides the appointment controversy, though, Berlin's other issue with Frick is the adoption of school prayers all across Thuringen. Here are some of the verses. Free us from deceit and betrayal. Make us strong for the liberating act. I believe you punish the country's betrayal and bless the liberating act of the homeland. I know that godlessness and treason tore apart and destroyed our people. Berlin takes issue with these verses because they are aimed against foreign policy, against the Reich's constitution, and against peace. Besides these concerns, another charge levied against the Nazis is that the prayers are anti-Semitic. In a session of the Turingen parliament this month, Frick, when confronted with these accusations, only comments on that last one. It is a monstrous misrepresentation to assert that the prayers are against Jews. They are not hate prayers, but prayers of freedom. But Frick also goes on the offensive. The most vile and disgraceful betrayal of the people in world history is that of 1918, and the most monstrous deception of the people is Marxism in theory and practice. A social democrat then takes the podium and, after outlining the complete German military collapse at the end of the Great War, remarks that this is the most blatant falsehood that has been spoken in the Turing and Parliament. Vorwärts, the social democrat mouthpiece writes, 
Frigg says, my name is Rabbit. I know nothing and have said nothing. In contrast, his party friend Mechta loudly says what Mr. Frick, for tactical reasons, will not repeat. This friend actually says, in reference to another verse, he and his party friends primarily understood alien and foreign forces to mean the Jews. At this time, there is no indication that Frick has any plans to repeal the school prayer directive. While Germany struggles with its federal system, invitations from Paris for an even bigger federal system arrive. French Foreign Minister Aristide Briand sends out a memorandum. In it, he shares his vision for Europe's future and the peaceful coexistence of its inhabitants. Essentially, he proposes that a a European Union should be established within the confines of the League of Nations. Possible names for the project include the European League or European Federation. It is to first be of a purely economic nature, minimizing tariffs between European states and then later to become a political endeavor, binding the same states closer together. In Brian's vision, a permanent secretariat for this new organization and a, a European Council should be established in Geneva. This would draw heavily from the procedures and structures of the League of Nations, but Briand stresses that his proposal is not a United States of Europe. Two German parties, the Nazi Party and the Communist Party, are not fans of this French idea. For the Nazis, knitting closer ties with the creators of the Treaty of Versailles is anathema. The communists, on the other hand, have nothing against an international order of European states in theory, but criticize the exclusion of the Soviet Union, who are not a member of the League of Nations. They quote Lenin. The United States of Europe under capitalism are either impossible or reactionary. Other than those two, though, this initiative is welcomed by, by most parties in Germany across the political spectrum. The German Reichszeitung, a Catholic conservative newspaper, asks... Can 20th century Germany comprehend that for centuries the German tribes fought each other as bitter enemies? Did not hatred, strife, jealousy, and a thirst for power become the great, strong, unified German Reich? So, yeah, most parties welcome this as-of-yet vague notion of a European, whatever you want to call it, for the sake of peace and economic growth. But this is not the only news from France on the German people's minds, for on the very same day as Briand's memorandum, May 18th, other news reach Berlin. All French troops are to leave the Rheinland. This was one of the main reasons Germany agreed to the Young Plan earlier this year, and now it is official. On May 17th, at 6.30 p.m., the French government sends the order to all French military commanders in Germany to carry out the previously established plan for troop withdrawal. Just hours before, the reparations commissions found that all necessary conditions for the implementation of the Young Plan have been met. So, at least in theory, nothing stands in the way of a French exodus from German territory. While it is not explicitly stated by which date the evacuation will be complete, it is speculated by German newspapers that the deadline agreed upon in the Young Plan, June 30th, will be met. Uh, however, the French government's decision is met with internal resistance. Many prominent military figures argue that it would be impossible to withdraw the French troops by then. Some in Germany feel that this may be an attempt to coerce the Germans to make additional concessions related to the Young Plan. Once more, the reparations payments lie at the heart of the issue. Essentially, the reparations people want to ensure that for the final 22 years of the reparations plan, repayments will not fluctuate with currency exchange rates. In the end, the Germans do not agree and successfully call this bluff. In France, the decision in general is still a big issue. Many fear that Germany could militarize and threaten France once more. One of the loudest such voices is former French Prime Minister Poincaré. He criticizes the move and attacks the Weimar Republic. Germany is completely devoid of trustworthiness in both domestic and foreign policy. Germany not only avoided fulfilling the preconditions for the loyal execution of the Young Plan, but also increased its military spending in blatant violation of the Versailles limitations. Moreover, it is plausible to think that the Reichswehr supports secret groups, maintains black organizations, and increases material beyond the loud limits. According to our researchers here at the Weimar Wire, the German army currently has 102,270 eight 
personnel and costs about 1% of German GDP. Thus, while Weimar may, strictly speaking, violate some stipulations of the Treaty of Versailles, it does not violate the limitations put on military spending. At least not officially. That leads me to the Weimar Wire political indicator, brought to you by TimeGhost to gauge this month's trends. The Brüning government experiences a small reprieve from the constant attacks it has been under because of the liberation of the Rheinland, which firmly benefits all the young plan advocates. The Social Democrats also benefit. So for the moment, the SPD and the majority of the Brüning government both trend yeah, about around the neutral mark, with a slight recovery. But at the fringes, the communists and the Nazis still use economic hardship and uncertainty for their benefit, remaining firmly on the upward trend they have experienced pretty much since the start of the global economic crisis. And now, before we finish, on to a new segment of the Weimar Wire monthly coverage. Where's Hitler? What's Adolf up to this month? Well, currently, Adolf Hitler resides in a luxurious nine-room apartment at the Prince Regentenplatz 16 in Munich. He lives there with his niece, Angela Maria, or Geli, Raubal. Nothing wrong with living with your niece. Well, technically, she is his half-niece, and she is in Munich to study medicine at the Ludwig Maximilian University. Hitler's driver was fired, actually, the other year for having a relationship with Raubal and wanting to marry her. He needed Hitler's consent since she was underage. And Hitler is very controlling with who Geli sees and when and where. This month, Hitler is on a speaking tour of the country promoting his Nazi message. He spoke twice in Berlin, he spoke in Regensburg, in Gotha, and in Munich. Many find his ideas about Germany's future disturbing. But you know, as in every other month, May gives rise to pressing questions about the future of Germany, both general and specific. Will the economic recession continue? Which of the visions for a future Germany will come to pass? The social democratic one, the communist one, or maybe the national socialist one? What will happen in Saxony? Who will take control and form the new government? Will Frick have to give in to Berlin on police appointments or school prayers? Or will he stand his ground? Is the idea of a European Union a pipe dream, or could it come to pass? And what will happen after the French troops leave the Rhineland for good? I imagine we'll find out the answers to at least some of those questions when we return at the end of June. To support us getting there, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. It's the army that makes all our work possible and keeps our productions running. Until next time, Weimar Wire signing off. Excelsior! Excelsior!